Good morning. I'm Wendy Craig and I'm the scientific director of PrevNet. And on behalf of our team, I'd like to welcome you everyone to our webinar today. Wherever you are located, please join us in acknowledging and thanking the generations of indigenous peoples who have cared for these lands and in celebrating the continued strength and spirit of indigenous peoples. I personally have been on a learning journey to understand the strengths and challenges of indigenous youth. And it's this journey that's helping me take another perspective and broaden my own personal uh, journey and understanding. I'm a white fourth generation settler and I'm, I think of myself as a mother, a friend and a researcher. And through learning more about Indigenous children and youth and their strengths and challenges, I hope to continue to support Indigenous peoples in our country. I'm really excited about today's webinar. We're bringing uh, this webinar from our community of practice that's brought together people in different projects to address teen and youth dating violence and is funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada. Today, we are absolutely thrilled and pleased to partner with uh, personal disclosure now, my very good friend, Francoise Mathieu, and she's a compassion fatigue specialist for her webinar that's entitled The Edge of Compassion, Staying Well While Working in High Stress Environments. Before I introduce her, and I've been told I'm not allowed to tell many personal stories, I'll go through our webinar format for the day. Um, Francoise is going to present for approximately 50 minutes, and during her presentation, we invite you to type in any comments or questions that you may have for her in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen in either French or English. And we will track those questions and then pull from them and present them to Francoise at the end of her presentation during the last 10, 15 minutes of the webinar. We have posted a link to Francoise's webinar slides in both English and French, and you can find the link in the chat box. So you may like to print a copy to follow along and make notes. At the end of the webinar in the chat box, you will see a link to our evaluation. And that's the evaluation of this webinar. It's really important that you complete this. We really value the responses that people provide to us through these evaluations. And they really help us in guiding and planning for the future webinars to ensure that we can make your needs. And you must know that all of the feedback is anonymous. So please take the two minutes at the end of our uh, webinar today to complete the survey. And once you've finished the evaluation form, you'll be directed to a website where you'll be prompted to enter your full name and email, which is separate from the evaluation. And once you've done that, you will receive a certificate of at attendance and it will be generated and emailed to you. The webinar is being recorded today. So after the webinar, we'll send out a link to everyone that's registered so they can share the recording or listen to it if they weren't able to join us today. So that's all I have in terms of the background, and I'm hoping that this fabulous webinar is going to be a lot longer than that long preamble. But it is truly my great pleasure to introduce Francoise Mathieu. I had the, the honor of knowing her for the last 25 years, and it's I know from experience and have watched her become an international expert in the area of compassion fatigues and self-care and wellness and organizational health. She currently is the executive director of TEND, whose aim is to offer consulting and training to professionals on topics related to secondary trauma, compassion fatigue, burnout, self-care, wellness, and organizational health. Francoise is a registered psychotherapist and a subject matter expert on topics related to compassion to fatigue and secondary trauma. Her experience stems from over 20 years as a mental health professional, working as a crisis counselor and trauma specialist in the university counseling setting in the mil with military personnel, law enforcement, and other community mental health environments. I have listened to Francoise speak several times, and what I have to tell you is she's going to give you an evidence-based approach and evidence-based strategies to address self-care and, and, and wellness for you. And her, she'll do this with humor so that by the end of this hour, you're going to be well-informed, entertained, and filled with many new strategies to move forward in a healthy way in your life. So it's a delight to have Francoise with us, and I'm now gonna hand the presentation over to her. Thank you very much, Wendy. Just making sure everyone can hear me before we get started. Sound good? We're good? Yeah? I presume we're good, because nobody's yes, telling good. me you can't hear me. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be uh, taking part in this webinar. 
And I wanted to give you a couple of disclaimers before we get started. I am a, a fast talker. It's a challenge I always have. I get very passionate and excited about this topic and I start talking too fast. And I can never really work within the, the, the parameters of time limits. So I may skip a few slides at some point uh, just in the interest of time, but please rest assured that I'll make sure that I cover all the most important elements and if I do skip a few things, uh, I'm making sure that you still get to hear, you know, the good and juicy bits as well. Uh, je voulais aussi dire bonjour à tous les francophones qui sont sur l'appel. Si vous avez des questions, vous pouvez les demander en français. Um, so I want to start by giving you a little background to how I became interested in this. And I know that there's a very wide range of participants in terms of your professional uh, duties, your training, the roles and responsibilities you have in your workplace. And what we found in delivering these workshops, oh my gosh, I think I've trained over 100,000 people now in North America on these topics over the last uh, 18 years, is that there actually is a lot of um, cross application to the strategies I'm going to mention. Uh, we work mostly with uh, multidisciplinary teams. I was just in North Dakota last week working with child abuse and human trafficking investigators. But there are also teachers there and social workers and volunteers and attorneys and law enforcement and advocates. So we're really excited to see how the concepts I'm going to discuss really have good cross application. Um, as Wendy mentioned, uh, what I will be uh, discussing is evidence based when it can be. And if it's if there is no hard research, it will be evidence informed. And what we also uh, use are consensus guidelines. So those are called expert consensus guidelines, which is the creation um, some years ago of a think tank of experts on the topics related to secondary trauma. And uh, we have been collecting um, best practice recommendations from them. I'm not gonna focus that much on the research or the science today. I really wanted to focus on concrete tools. But if you're interested in the data or the research, I'll provide our email address at the end, and I'm very happy to provide um, a bibliography and additional research uh, kind of topics on that, or, or research resources on that topic. Um, <clears throat> but I actually want to start with the personal. I think that in order to understand the impact of this work on ourselves as professionals or volunteers or advocates, um, we need to understand where we're coming from and how our own experiences inform our reactions to this. I think one of the challenges sometimes, especially when we're working with youth, is that the stories are hard to hear. The resources are often limited. I know some of you are probably taking part in this call um, from you know, uh, more isolated regions where you don't have a ton of resources available. And what can happen at times is that um, our boundaries and the limits of our, you know, the end of our role, you know, between work and home can become blurred and we can get to a place where we start feeling um, that the demand will always outweigh what we can provide. And I think that that's a challenge that many of us have, particularly if we have our own lived experience related to the field in which we work, where, and I actually had this experience last week where uh, this investigator said to me, you know, he said, I'm one of the only people in North Dakota who can do this particular type of work or analysis. How can I take time off? I just feel so responsible. And I think that that's a constant challenge because the demand is so significant and we can't be all things to all people. And how do we figure that out? So the photo you see at the beginning of my slide deck is a picture I took in Banff a couple of years ago. Some of you who've been there will recognize this beautiful scene. And I was uh, presenting at a victim, um, victim support um, conference. So these were all people who provide victim assistance uh, to various degrees. And <clears throat> excuse me, when I got off stage, uh, one of the people very kindly came to thank me. And she said something that really st stayed with me afterwards. She said the following. She said, thank you for the workshop. It was very helpful, so on and so forth. And then she said, may you never require our services and i thought about that and i thought it was very profound you know what she was basically saying is a may you never be a victim of a crime that requires these services but also what she was saying is all of us at some point in our lives may require the services of other service providers who work in these fields and wouldn't we want to receive the best most compassionate care wouldn't we want the person listening to us 
to be well, to be present, not to be distracted, not to be bored because they've heard so many stories such as our own. And I'm not going to go into details because it's not relevant right now and everyone is fine, but a year later, um, we actually required the services <clears throat> of a victim service worker. My son was involved in it. You know, he was a victim of a crime. He is absolutely fine. Everyone is fine. Arrests have been made. It's not a story about my son's trauma, but it came back to me and I thought, oh, now I'm actually a consumer of these services, right? The, the shoes on the other foot. And part of what I noticed as my son and my family were going through this very traumatic event is that I had a really hard time going back to being a client or a service, you know, a recipient. I just wanted to case manage this trauma that we experienced. And I had this meta awareness of case managing the heck out of something where in that instance, maybe what I should have done is being a present parent, being available, you know, as a mom. And instead, I just wanted to handle it. I was not happy with the way victim services and the police had been engaged in this response. I had made a list of all my complaints. I had the you know, name, address, and salary of the detective involved. And at some point, my son said to me uh, with loving kindness, but he said, Mom, I don't need you to case manage this situation. And I think that that's an example of ways in which when we're engaged in this challenging work, that we sometimes have a hard time taking off that hat when we go home. I don't think that's just true for law enforcement. You know, law enforcement talk about that extensively. How do they transition from you know, work to home? But I think that's also true for any of us. So an example I'll give you, and then we'll launch right into the, the content, is if you're engaged in assisting folks who experience dating violence, what is that like for you if you have your own teenagers? Are you hyper vigilant about any person that they're you know, dating or they're engaged in a relationship with? Do you overly screen kind of some of the interactions or conversations do you have? Have you ever received feedback from children in your life, whether they're your own or someone else's kids, that you were hyper vigilant or that you were you know, um, always assuming kind of the worst possible scenario? Those things are normal. And it is normal that if we're very well versed in this issue that we're gonna be hyper aware of it. And it's not good or bad. I think conversely, because we know a lot about you know, relationships and dating violence, you may have loved ones or friends who are not in this field and they seem incredibly naive about certain things. Um, in another field, I remember at some point, a civilian, someone not in this field, saying to me, oh, I just met this person on Tinder and I'm gonna you know, bring him home for the weekend to meet my kids. And of course, my reaction was like, absolutely not because I know so much about you know, what can potentially happen. And so I think that that's part of the challenge of staying on the edge of compassion is figuring out this balance between knowing too much, being overly engaged, being disengaged, being disengaged at work because maybe we've heard so many similar stories, being disengaged at home because maybe the stories at home pale in comparison to what we hear you know, in our other role and trying to find the sweet spot between all of those. And that really has been um, my life's work in the last 20 years. I started out as a mental health professional, worked in the various settings doing crisis work and trauma work, a lot of sexual assault and dating violence work. And at some point, about five, six years into it, I didn't actually burn out. I just became really concerned about some of the service providers around me who seemed pretty crispy, you know, that some of them were still providing really good care for the folks who went to see them and other ones seemed to have really lost their empathy. And I started doing some research on that topic and now this is what I do full time. So that's kind of the short version of this journey. So TEND is a company that provides education and training across North America. We also offer a lot of free resources, which is really the only reason I'm mentioning my company right now because I'm not trying to promote anything, but if you go to our website, which is Tend Academy, you'll see a whole host of free resources and I'll post them at the end. We have fact sheets, we have toolkits, we have videos, lots of free things. And uh, we've learned a lot over the last two decades working with a very wide range of folks, as I mentioned before, from child protection to um, school boards to law enforcement to hospitals, you name it. 
So really, what was the, the motivation to, you know, to become interested in this was, I remember several years ago, I had probably been doing uh, the work as a crisis, um, I was working in a university setting, doing a lot of crisis work, a lot of mental health um, challenges, lots of limited resources, and the following thing happened. It was Friday afternoon, probably on a full moon, probably a quarter to five, you know, and I was supposed to pick my children up from daycare at five o'clock. We had uh, this daycare that had very strict rules about, you know, I, I, I was always the last parent there. I don't know what other people did. I was always running in, you know, and uh, this young man came in to see me and it, I literally had about 15 minutes and he was really um, pretty much high risk and I definitely had concerns about his safety. And I handled it in the way that I think you would when you don't have a lot of time, but the stakes are high. And I was pretty drastic, you know, I, I had him, it's very rare that I would do this, but in this case, I had him involuntarily committed to a, psych, psych, a psychiatric unit for a weekend. It's not something I've done very often, but in this instance, it felt like the best decision at the time. And then I went home for the weekend and it didn't sit very well with me. You know, I was thinking to myself, was that the right decision? Um, that has obviously ramifications in the future. Yes, of course I knew he was safe because I made sure of that, but I started asking myself, would I have done the same thing if it had been Monday morning and I was well rested and I didn't have, you know, all these time pressures and maybe I'd actually had a sandwich and I wasn't like low blood sugar. And I realized that there are certain instances where I absolutely stood by my decisions, however drastic they were, because that was the best practice and what I was supposed to do. And there are other times where I thought, I think that I became more involved or more drastic in this instance because I was depleted. And so that's always stayed with me to try and assess that, you know, when we have a very high volume of demand, when we are depleted physically and emotionally, or just we haven't slept enough, or we have five other, you know, things piling up, or we don't have a lot of time, there are times where all of us, and I'm including everyone in this group, it doesn't matter what you do for a living, if you're involved, if you're on this webinar, I'm sure that there are times where we can look back and think, my decision or my actions were really influenced and impacted by my level of well-being or my level of stress. And although I don't think that self-care is the magic, you know, recipe to cure all things, I, I do really believe in self-care. I think it's not enough to take good care of ourselves. I think that um, in the work that we do, we make a lot of systemic and organizational and team level recommendations, which I'll mention later. But I do think that if we are depleted and um, haven't slept enough and are completely you know, maxed out, and then we do this work and then at night we go home and watch six hours of CSI or forensic files, you know, I don't think we're giving our brain a chance to reset and refuel. And so I've always kept that in mind that I always wanted to say, you know, were my decisions uh, dictated by how much time and energy I had or were they dictated by what the person in front of me uh, needed and what was available? So just want to park that for a minute. But I always believe in uh, trying to be really honest with ourselves about the limitations of what we can do, but also making sure that we continue to provide ethical care to all of those who turn to us. Uh, for services. And that's really what um, got me motivated to, you know, start doing this full time. And now this is all I do is write and think and present on topics related to this. I wrote a book on the topic called The Compassion Fatigue Workbook. It was published in 2012. And the reason I wrote the book was originally I was working with the Northwest Territories uh, Crown Witness Coordinators, so people who were accompanied, accompanying folks in court and the resources were very limited in terms of, you know, flying a trainer up or bringing a whole bunch of people down. And I wanted to develop uh, resources that were really affordable and that people could use, you know, on their own, in their offices, kind of completing tool toolkits and self-assessments. And in order to write this book, uh, and the reason I'm sharing that with you is I had the opportunity to interview service providers from every walk of life. And, you know, whether they were teachers or social workers or school principals or mental health professionals, what have you. And I started collecting stories about not only the challenges of the work, but also the rewards of the work. And what I'm interested in wherever I go, I travel almost every week, some different location doing these workshops, is I love meeting people who've been around for a while, for a long while, and who are still well. 
So this is actually my first strategy I'm going to throw out there right now is I recommend, and I invite you to think about right now, a service provider that you know, who is maybe a trusted advisor, a beloved mentor, an elder, someone who's been around and is still seems to be have the love for the work and the passion and the commitment. And I want to invite you to ask them, how is that? What has sustained them? I think what you're going to find, certainly in my interviews, what I've found is that all of them will have had highs and lows around along their career. I don't think anyone says, you know, 40 years in the field, completely fine, never a bad day. So it's not about never burning out, sorry for the double negative, but it's not about never experiencing these low points, but it's being able to recognize when they're happening, maybe catch it early before it gets too severe. And all of them engage in what the research calls career sustaining behaviors. Career sustaining behaviors are behaviors that healthy um, professionals who seem to continue to enjoy this work, even though it's challenging, that they all engage in day to day. And it's not just, you know, collapsing on a beach or on a yoga mat once a year. So I'm sure we've all had that where you work so hard and then you go on holidays and you get sick, you know, the classic. This is about day to day processes that they have learned to reset themselves, to re-energize themselves every single day not just you know once a year. So I'm in really I'm really interested in career sustaining behaviors and it's actually a very interesting body of research and I have some uh, interesting research papers around that if you're interested. So in 2015, 2015 was really uh, the 25th anniversary of the birth of the field. I'm sure none of you had a special cake or a celebration but I got pretty excited about this. It was really marking the year where the very first research paper on secondary trauma, vicarious trauma, compassion fatigue, and I'll define those terms in a minute, but it was really the first, the 25th anniversary of the beginning of this field. And I really was looking for a community of practice. I live in Kingston, Ontario. Um, most of the folks I work with are all over North America. And I wanted to not only decrease my isolation socially, but I really wanted uh, an expert panel. I wanted to have um, an academic community where we could bounce things off and have a community of practice such as the one you have. So I was very lucky I found two colleagues in San Diego who felt the same way and we created the Secondary Traumatic Stress Consortium along with uh, several other professionals in the field. We're all in various fields, a lot of folks in child welfare and child uh, children's mental health, child abuse, but also folks who work with adults. And I'm providing the website here because the consortium provides free resources. Everything on the consortium website is absolutely free. And we intend to be a clearinghouse for resources related to secondary traumatic stress. So if you're interested in more on that topic, I invite you to go and visit the website. So we meet on a regular basis and we have all sorts of dialogue and discussion about this. So let's clarify what we mean by all these terms that I've been throwing around. And this is not just uh, doing a you know, death by PowerPoint definition stuff. It's more giving you concrete examples so that you can quickly get a sense of the difference between the terms. And what I find is when I understand what's happening, I can also then identify tools to reduce that you know, kind of problem or that issue. It's also really good to have a quick uh, definition of these terms so that you can explain it pretty rapidly to another person. And so I'll give you that example. So what is compassion fatigue? Compassion fatigue really refers to the profound emotional and physical exhaustion that you can develop over time, either at work or at home or both. And often it's a result of either seeing the same person over and over again. So that might be that um, a person that you serve or maybe a family member or loved one has a chronic issue. And as we know with unhealthy relationships, um, there's a lot of chronicity involved, right? People returning to the unhealthy partner repeatedly. And we can see a real spike in this erosion of empathy in service providers, particularly if you don't have a lot of training in domestic violence and unhealthy relationships. You know, if you don't have the background to understand what is the process of leaving and how complex it is, that at some point we can develop this erosion because people are not making movement in the way that we wish they would. Another way you can develop compassion fatigue or a strain on your empathy 
is having a very large volume of similar cases. So I think that, you know, I'm sure there's some of you on the call who've been around for a long time and you've probably seen thousands of cases that almost blend into each other. They seem so similar. And on the plus side, having a lot of experience can be protective because when we're confident and competent, we're not as distressed by what's coming in front of us. You know, you might see someone and think to yourself, I know how to help. I have resources. I have a network of connections. And so you're not sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, I've never heard this before. What do I do? The flip side though is at some point we can develop a certain desensitization because we've heard so many cases over and over again and that we get kind of numb to that. And so compassion fatigue can also happen at home. Um, the example I often give um, is, you know, let's say you have a friend that's uh, going through a really difficult crisis and you're there for them and you're like, I got you, you know, whatever you need. And, uh, but then maybe they don't get better. Maybe there's, I'll give you an example. Maybe they're dealing with addiction and they relapse. And how many times are you gonna still be as present and available? And some of us, we have a very big pool of empathy. We're like, I got this, whatever you need. And repeatedly we're able to do that. Whereas in other cases, you got nothing. You're like, I've helped you four times, I'm done. And so compassion fatigue can look like that as well in our personal lives, where we just feel depleted because we've tried so many things and none of them seem to have worked. Secondary trauma, which is often referred to as vicarious trauma or indirect trauma, really refers to all the ways in which your worldview is altered by the stories that we hear and um, witness. So there are many examples of that. I gave one earlier where I was saying, um, you know, that maybe you're very uh, hyper aware of unhealthy relationships and so you can't switch that off. And so you screen everybody in your personal life, you know, for those behavior patterns. Um, I'm showing two photos here. Um, so the photo of the motorbike might be completely neutral for you, but when I work with folks who work in a trauma unit in a hospital, they have negative associations with that image because for them, that's an accident waiting to happen. The photo on the right, which is a very benign photo from a Hollywood movie of a soccer coach talking to his, you know, uh, a soccer player. When I show that photo to people who do a lot of uh, child abuse work, they immediately have a hostile image or, reality, or a reaction to that image. And their first thought is, you know, something sinister is happening. So what happens is when we've seen and heard a lot of difficult things, it can hitch a ride with us to some degree. And we need to notice that. And sometimes I find that that ebbs and flows for me. I'm doing a lot of trauma work and then I'm going home and watching a lot of trauma stuff on Netflix. I tend to be more, you know, hyper aware. And there's certain times where, you know, my secondary trauma can be a little bit calmer depending on how I'm taking care of myself. But I think that there is a loss of innocence to some degree. Karen Sick Whitney and Lorianne Perlman called it an occupational hazard. I don't think that we can do this work in a truly caring and empathic way without being affected to some degree. And what we need to do as a strategy is be able to notice that when it's starting to interfere, you know, maybe we're dreaming or thinking about certain cases, we become very preoccupied with certain cases, or they start intruding um, in our sense of safety about the world. So what are factors that increase the risks of burnout, compassion fatigue, and secondary traumatic stress? I'm gonna to present to you, obviously in the interest of time, I'm not gonna spend a huge amount of time on this, but this is a tool that the think tank, the Secondary Traumatic Stress Consortium developed. And the way it works is the following. We were dissatisfied with the use of, with the terminology out there, you know, a lot of groups, uh, physicians, for example, use the word burnout for everything. It's like the catch-all phrase for anything that's got to do with provider impairment. A lot of groups in domestic violence use the word vicarious trauma to mean everything. Other groups were using compassion fatigue. It was all like in the same pot. And what we wanted is to tease apart what's actually going on because the more you can understand what's happening for you, the more you can actually um, implement strategies or interventions that um, are going to help. And so the way the circles work is quickly, um, the first one at the top is looking at personal vulnerabilities. If you have lived experience, which many of us in our fields have, um, with something related to trauma, uh, you may be more vulnerable you know, than someone who isn't. There might be certain triggers that are you know, more fragile or not. You might have done a lot of great work, 
and you're really aware of your personal vulnerabilities. Um, if you're going through a difficult time in your personal life, you're going through a divorce, financial stress, issues with a child, what have you, um, you know, sick relative, obviously that's going to impact your ability to be present and focused on the people who need you in your work environment. Work-related traumatic grief and loss refers to situations in the workplace that are traumatic. So um, a, a client, I don't know that you necessarily call your folks clients, but for the sake of argument, a client dies uh, in a tragic way. How do we get closure for that? Do we get support? Often we're so busy that we just have a new person fill that, you know, that gap and we just don't have time to process. A colleague dies. A colleague is laid off, marched out by security, and you never find out why. Your agency is disbanded or reorganized and you lose your beloved colleagues. There's so many ways in which uh, I don't think we talk enough about work-related losses and, and, and how that can bring up a lot of challenges in terms of dealing with the stress of the work that we do. Direct exposure is, um, we started using that term with first responders and child protection workers who uh, were in dangerous environments. So they're actually directly exposed. So firsthand, you're a witness to what's going on, or maybe you're even in danger, you know, on the side of a highway if there's been an accident, or you have to go in dangerous neighborhoods. So some of you may or may not um, have risk of direct exposure in your workplace. And that will, um, the research has found that direct exposure will dramatically increase the chances of some folks developing post-traumatic stress disorder, which I think, uh, you know, is understood now in terms of a whole other body of research. Indirect trauma is what I was just referring to, the secondary trauma, the ways in which we hear stories from uh, the folks we work with. So clients come and disclose difficult stories and that may impact us. We may talk to one another as colleagues uh, you know, debriefing formally or informally. And often we don't ask permission. We're not just like saying, hey, I need a debrief. It's more like, have you got a minute? And then we barf each other on each other, you know, all the trauma we just seen. I've seen that a lot of informal, uh, not on purpose, but we're still sometimes re-traumatizing each other. I also find that a lot of courses can be quite traumatic. I go to a lot of um, domestic violence and child abuse conferences and Quite frankly, I find them to be quite traumatic at times that they're maybe sharing unnecessary uh, graphic details that I don't need to see photos of crime scenes. I'm not a, an investigator. So there's kind of that extraneous exposure we may develop. I've already talked about compassion fatigue, so moving on to systems failure. This is actually one of the biggest ones. And when I talk to agency partners, often they'll say, yeah, the stories are hard. We know how to handle that. Yes, sometimes we have compassion fatigue. What we really want help with is moral distress. And moral distress really lives in that category of systems failures. Moral distress refers to situations where we fundamentally disagree with the laws, rules, regulations, policies. And we have long conversations about that during our day-long workshops when there's time where people will talk about, you know, aging out of the system. This kid aged out and all of a sudden he's got no resources. This person would, was discharged from the hospital with no proper care. Um, we could have a long conversations about that, a conversation about that. And system failure is a really tough one because as individual providers or even supervisors or leaders, we don't always have control or influence over the bigger system. And so how do we deal with our own distress around um, you know, the, the issues in the system that we fundamentally are opposed to. Now, there are times where I've spoken to people who've said, I left, you know, I was completely against morally or ethically what was going on and I, I left, I left the agency, I went to a different, even completely different field. What other people who've stayed, so remember my career sustaining behavior people, is what they've said is they said, I found a way to make peace with it by sharing, by venting, by advocating, and by also deciding what is within my control and what isn't, because otherwise this whole thing can just swallow us whole. Working conditions is where burnout lives. Working conditions have to do with your hours, your rewards, your recognition, who you immediately report to. So research has shown that what matters most for employee happiness is not where they work, but who they immediately report to matters more than where they work, which is really interesting, right? Perceptions of trust, uh, 
my boss trusts me, my boss gives me flexibility, I have an interesting job, I get positive feedback on a regular basis, all of those are part of working conditions. Obviously adequate pay is really nice too and flexibility, people say that um, they're more satisfied with work. There was a study done by Linda Duxbury out of Carleton that was looking at actually Canadian healthcare workers and four out of five healthcare workers said that they would choose control over their schedule over more money. So they wanted, they were more interested in, in work and kind of picking their schedule or their shifts than having an increase in pay, which is very interesting. The final circle, I'm going to be totally transparent with you here. We added the social cultural circle after the 2016 American election. Just being real honest here, uh, what we started seeing are people feeling very distressed about some of the policies, rules, regulations that were being implemented by the new federal government in the United States. And they were talking about their own um, challenges when, let's say, um, they are from um, a mar marginalized community themselves and they serve folks who are also from their, the same marginalized community and that they were having real hard time, not only um, in their work, but maybe they were experiencing, for example, discrimination themselves. And I was recently working in Los Angeles in a youth detention center, and some of my service providers who uh, are Hispanic said that um, they were feeling frustrated because a lot of the kids in detention who did not speak English, that they were being asked to be informal interpreters or translators or cultural experts uh, because of the language they spoke when that was not, not actually their specialty or their training at all. So as you see, very big discussion we could have about each of these, but I just want to give you a snapshot. We have found this to be incredibly useful in assisting people to assess, you know, which ones of these are um, areas of concern for you right now, and then that's going to really inform the strategies that we recommend based on each circle. Um, so I've talked about moral distress before. So what are the tools? What works? How do we remain on the edge of compassion? So really the question is the following. What is the sweet spot between caring too, too much and not caring at all? Because I think you'll all agree that none of us, if we needed a service, would want to go see someone who's in the don't care category and they're totally phoning it in and they don't care anymore. But we don't necessarily need to become rescuers and superheroes and be so engaged in everyone's challenges that we lose sight of our own objectivity or boundaries. And so the sweet spot is the $64,000 question. How do we find the way to be right in the middle? And I'm going to offer you some tools around that and some really interesting research. So Richard Harrison and Marv Westwood at, at UBC, uh, this was actually Richard Harrison's uh, PhD thesis. and uh, he wrote this beautiful paper, really recommend you read it if you're interested, and uh, what Richard did for his thesis is he interviewed a peer-nominated master therapist. So these were folks who were considered truly the best in the West. Uh, these were therapists that had been identified by everyone in the community as compassionate. You know, they had it all, and everyone really spoke highly of them. And what he researched is what were the practices that they engaged in day to day to stay well? So there were 17 different things that they found that all of them uh, engaged in. But one of them is they all practiced what Richard coined uh, exquisite empathy. And exquisite empathy is the ability to care just the right amount, which I know is a very elusive concept, right? How do I care just the right amount about the person in, you know, sitting in front of me? How do I find a way to uh, stay present and aware of how I'm feeling, but also be engaged with them? So that concept of exquisite empathy is achieved through something that's called equanimity. And equanimity is not about staying perfectly balanced all the time. So it's actually, I'm using kind of the wrong image for this. It's about being able to return to baseline very rapidly. So it doesn't mean you're not going to have ups and downs, you know, highs and lows as you hear or read or, you know, consume difficult material. It's the ability to come back to this healthy baseline on a regular basis. So there's actually research about how that can be done. There was a study done by Lutz and others, and it was actually repeated uh, afterwards, that found that Buddhist monks, who as you know are called expert meditators or master meditators. So expert meditators are people who have meditated for a minimum of 10,000 up to 25,000 hours in their lifetime. 
I've never done that, by the way, you know, maybe three minutes at a time. And what they found is uh, they had a, a group of Buddhist monks and then they had a control group and uh, they did some fMRI scans with them. So they did brain scans with both groups. And what they did is they exposed both groups to traumatic images and sounds, obviously with their consent. And uh, sounds, because some of you know that actually auditory uh, trauma, hearing auditory trauma can sometimes be more distressing than visual trauma. And so what they found is they measured um, these two groups and their brain responses. And what they found is they found two things. The first one is that uh, Buddhist monks had absolutely no change in their limbic system. So, you know, many of you know the amygdala, the limbic system is considered to be the smoke detector of the brain. It's the part of the brain that uh, seems to change in shape and size um, for people with post-traumatic stress disorder, for example. <clears throat> and the Buddhist monks had absolutely no activity there. So they were seeing and hearing these difficult things, but nothing, you know, they weren't being negatively impacted by it or distressed. And that alone is not that interesting a finding. You could say, well, yeah, they just went to their happy place. They have 25,000 hours of meditation experience. However, what they also found is that these Buddhist monks had an increase in feelings of compassion and love towards the suffering individual. So not only were they not altered or affected in a negative way, they actually experienced a growth and increase in compassion. So that's actually why um, I'm sure many of you, maybe you practice mindfulness or maybe you've heard about it till you know, you're know you sick and tired of it and, and you're like, I'm never gonna meditate, I'm never gonna do that. What's actually been found is that the reason there's such a focus on particularly mindfulness-based stress reduction is that it does allow you to return to baseline. And there's actually one of the very few randomized, randomized controlled trials studies uh, in compassion fatigue is an RCT looking at how mindfulness-based stress, stress reduction successfully reduces people's compassion fatigue. So it does work. Now the question is, how much do we need to do? Do we need to do tens of hours? Do we need to only four or five minutes? And the jury's out about that. But, oh, this is a slide that was given to me by um, the Los Angeles police because they weren't too keen on this meditation. <laughs> Come on, inner peace, I don't have all day. So what we did instead to convince them of the benefits of this is we rebranded it and we started calling it tact tactical breathing or combat breathing. And then they're like, oh yeah, we want to do it. It's just mindfulness, whatever works. So what we found is that um, even a few minutes uh, between uh, appointments, uh, you know, using a mindfulness app, all of those practices can make a huge difference to teaching us. Because as many of you know, that becomes a, a learned response. The more I do it, uh, before, during, and after exposure, the more I can actually return to equanimity and return to baseline. So there are lots of apps that uh, many of you are familiar with. Um, I'm not endorsing any of them, whatever works for you. But even having you know, a three to five minute process um, can be very protective and very helpful in the future. We can't ignore the basics of human physiology. To go back to what I was saying at the beginning with my Friday afternoon versus Monday morning, there was a study done in Israel that found that judges were more likely to grant people parole right after lunch than before lunch by a huge percentage. I forget the exact number, but it was something like, you know, before lunch, you were 30% likely to get parole and after lunch, you were 60% likely to get parole. And as I often joke, you know, they just needed a sandwich. Uh, we can't ignore the basics of human physiology. I'm always alarmed by um, how Sleep deprivation has become like this point of pride. So I go to many workshops, agencies, I meet people all the time. And I'm often the only person in the room who's had eight hours of sleep or more the night before. And I'm not just talking about, you know, you're going through perimenopause or you got a puppy or you have newborns. Like I understand. These are people who are deliberately kind of choosing to do other things rather than sleep. And I have concerns about that because it affects you know, our reaction time and our problem solving skills. So we can't ignore the basics. So the way that I recommend that we start monitoring this individually is to look at your own warning signs. You know, How do you know you're in the green zone when you're feeling great? How do you know you're in the red zone? But more interestingly, what's the sweet spot between? How do you know that you're starting to shift from green to yellow to red? And uh, you can actually see on our website, we have a, a free toolkit where, you know, we outline all of those warning signs. But, you know, really looking at yourself physically, behaviorally, emotionally, 
And I call them the big three because many of us have lots of these, but what are the top three most frequent warning signs that you see? And what I often say is, if you're not sure what they are, ask your loved ones, they will be delighted to tell you, they know. And I find that I have always the same three warning signs, you know, um, irritability is a big one for me. Becoming a drill sergeant where I just want, I lose, I'm not fine anymore. I just want to go through lists and get things done, you know, at night, get home and I'm like, got a checklist and a clipboard and a whistle um, <clears throat> and other factors. And the more I recognize those, the more I can catch this early, excuse me, <clears throat> before I go into the red zone. The other thing I want to invite you to think about is what do you do for leisure time? So years ago, when I was a crisis counselor at the university, I also volunteered at the Kingston Penitentiary, which are photos from Kingston Penn there. Um, and I would volunteer um, with uh, First Nations lifers who were in, the, in there. And then I would go home and I would watch something like The Wire or you know, some super traumatic TV show. And I started realizing that that wasn't, like volunteering at the Kingston Penitentiary is not a hobby actually. And that maybe if you do this for a living, volunteering in this field and then watching more trauma never gave my nervous system a chance to reset and refuel. How do we transition from work to home? No judgment, all of these things are legal, none of my business, but you know, understanding when we're starting to see patterns where we're numbing out. And so instead of doing a leisurely activity, what we're really doing is watching seven hours of Netflix until the sign comes up that says, you know, are you still watching? Um, there's some really interesting research on resetting ourselves before, during, and after. I've talked about sleep already. But part of what's interesting to know is that the reason we can't always shut it off after a big day or a really upsetting event is that, of, of course, we're flooded with stress hormones, including cortisol. And one of the things that we recommend, we call the hot walk and talk. And hot walk and talk is basically a strategy we've developed that's super easy. What it is is you find a colleague, you ask them to walk. You drink some water, not too much water, like just drink a bit of water, and talk out what's going on. And all of those things, drinking water, physically walking, connecting with another person, and talking about what's going on is called a hot walk and talk. It's a way to very quickly reset and feel you know, a little bit less of that stress hormone that's so kind of affecting you. So I'm just aware of the time. So I have a couple of minutes before we turn to questions. So I'm going to skip a few slides here because I want to finish by talking about a couple of last things. Uh, when you talk about it, don't slime each other. Sliming is when you are sharing all the graphic stories and the details with one another. And sometimes it becomes almost like a competition, like who had the harder day. And we have a very simple protocol that's on our website. Again, it's totally free. Um, we created these postcards, uh, steps to low impact debriefing. You can print them, photocopy them, give them to everyone you want, totally free. And there are basically four steps to protect ourselves from oversharing and developing a bit of that awareness of you know, asking for permission before we share information, uh, giving people a heads up that you're there to talk about that and not about you know, the emergency goalie that came, if you don't know what I'm talking about, the emergency goalie, so you know what I'm talking about. So you know, if they think you're about to talk about the Maple Leafs game this weekend as opposed to a trauma, they're not necessarily gonna be ready to hear that stuff. So I'm gonna skip that because I wanna finish with a couple of last things. The final piece I want to address is beware of being in reactivity mode. A lot of us who work in high volume, you know, fast pace, lots of stress, lots of trauma exposure in our workplace, sometimes we can get very reactive and kind of go into that mode all the time where um, the example I often give is, you know, have you ever sp spilt milk all inside your fridge? all into the vegetable crisper, you know? And there are times where that happens and you go bananas. You go into hyper arousal, um, or maybe you're stuck in traffic and you get road rage. And there's other times where, you know, you spill the milk and you're pretty zen and you're like, oh, well, I was gonna clean the fridge anyways. And the third option, you just lie in the milk and you're like, I'm done, you know, <laughs> I surrender. And it's a really quick way to understand what we call the window of tolerance framework. And the window of tolerance is the following. So the sweet spot is, you know, kind of when we're feeling really well and low arousal is when you lie in the puddle of milk and high arousal is when you go bananas and rip the door off the fridge. And the thing that's really interesting is all the recommendations such as enough sleep, mindfulness, um, enough rest, all of that, what that does is it actually widens your window of tolerance. So you have a wider ability to deal with what comes at you and what you'll find is a lot of folks who've had a lot of trauma or adversity, 
they tend to have a very narrow window of tolerance. So they tend to go to high or low arousal really quickly because that window has not had a chance to widen itself. And that's what therapy and all of these modalities can do is help us have a wider window of tolerance. So I'm gonna finish by recommending also social support. You know, building a community of practice such as what you're doing, being able to share and have dialogue with one another uh, can be really important. And many of you know uh, the wonderful quote from Dr. Bruce Perry that says, there's no more effective neurobiological intervention than a safe relationship. That's not just true for the people that we serve and for the youth, it's also true for us as service providers, being able to connect with one another. So I'll finish with this photo. So this is a photo of my son on the left. Um, a couple of years ago, is uh, I started with him, so I thought finish with him. A couple of years ago, we got up at five o'clock in the morning and we went fishing and we caught nothing and we froze and we had a great day. And I'm gonna tell you right now that I cherish that day more than emptying my inbox, you know what I mean? And uh, I think that sometimes we also need to reconnect with what brings us joy and how we reconnect to the world because we'll never be done with the demands of the work and we have to find this balance. So um, basically, uh, in conclusion, there are lots of strategies to remain healthy and, and compassionate. Um, looking at the Venn diagram, looking at the warning signs, looking at basic health practices such as sleep and enough exercise, understanding the window of tolerance, figuring out ways to reset ourselves when we've had a tough day or heard a tough story, looking at the hot walk and talk, making sure that we don't slime each other when we share that information, considering a digital detox so that we're not watching trauma content at night if that's what we do during the day, social support, and digging where the ground is soft. So of all the things that I've discussed, where can you start? So I'm gonna turn it over to questions now and uh, happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Francoise. That was absolutely fabulous, and many of us benefited from your question, uh, from your presentations, and it did generate some questions. So now we get to pretend we're like on our talk show. Uh, so one of the questions from our audience uh, that that's come through is, can you explain a bit more about the window of tolerance? Oh yeah, absolutely. So the window of tolerance, uh, actually there's a really good link. If you go to St. Michael's Hospital, you just go St. Michael's and then M-A-S-T, M-A-S-T, there's a mindfulness, uh, there's a whole ex explanation. So the window of tolerance comes um, from Siegel and Ogden. They became really interested in, uh, they were working with trauma uh, survivors and they became really interested in this idea that people not only go into hyper arousal, so we know that. I think we're all familiar with hyper arousal, which is, the old story is, you know, soldier comes back from combat and jumps every time she hears a loud noise. Um, but we were less familiar with hypo arousal, which is what we will often see when we work with folks who uh, come from multi-generational trauma or maybe residential school survivors, that sometimes it'll actually be the shutdown phenomena. And we feel like it's been under-identified where people will actually go into more of the freeze response. And so there's some really interesting work uh, looking at, yeah, Siegel and Ogden would be where you can look at that and real knowledge now that we can widen the window of tolerance and that all the modalities that we're recommending, such as you know mindfulness, um, good quality therapy, and all of those modalities actually widen people's ability to not necessarily bounce back and forth between hyper and hypo arousal. Okay, great, thank you for that. Um, we had another question from Megan. What are some common and easy examples of career sustaining behaviors? Thanks. Ooh, okay, you're getting into like my favorite topic of all. So, good examples of career sustaining behaviors. So, um, I have to think because there's so many. Right, so I have a really good example. One of them is called uh, individualized act of, um, of, it's very long, but it's basically service providers who within the limits of their work have also find ways of having individualized acts of personal kindness. So I'll give you an example. There's a really good, although quite harrowing, just warning you, good documentary on Netflix called Heroin. So Heroin with the E in brackets, it actually won an award last year. And it's a documentary about a drug court, fire chief, and an outreach worker in the heart of Westchester, Virginia, which is the heart of the opioid epidemic. They do harm reduction and they are engaged with people who are abusing and overdosing on opioids. They, in the documentary, you can see exactly that 
uh, these interpersonal moments where in spite of the challenges of the work, they still, they engage in, you'd almost have to see the documentary to understand this drug court judge, she is tough, but she is fair. She's found a way to be compassionate and be able to provide service for people in front of her in a way that still shows compassion and kindness, and that's actually less depleting for her. Another example is, um, this is a very grim topic, I apologize, but uh, death notifications. So as you know, providing death notification is an extremely challenging part of someone's work and law enforcement. But we've actually found some professionals who do it using low impact debriefing, the strategy I mentioned earlier. And what they found is that when they did it with care, kindness, and compassion, not only were the recipients uh, less Obviously, they're still very traumatized, but they were less upset and more grateful. And as the provider, you they actually felt more sustained. So the police officer who described this to me said, I actually know it's a tough job, but I'm really good at it. And so I know how to give bad news in a way that doesn't further add to the trauma. Another example of career sustaining behaviors are moment-by-moment uh, -moment awareness. And so all the people in Harrison's study said that they were not just waiting till the end of their day to refuel, that they were constantly self-aware. Like right now, where am I sitting in my chair? What's going on in front of me? What about right this minute? You know, not falling into the stories, but really being able to find that optimal distance between the people in front of you and ourselves. Another one, I'll give you one more, there's so many. Um, good quality mentoring and having access to that you know, community of practice where you feel that you have a chance to grow and learn on the job, that you're not plateaued. And yeah, there's so many more, but just wanted to give you a sample. Okay, great. Um, just sort of following up on that, someone asked about any recommendations for books or resources on sustainable career behaviors. Ooh, yeah, so I have a couple of research papers. Maybe what I could do actually is, uh, can I send them to you and you send them to the network? Would that be a good Absolutely. way to do it? Absolutely. Okay, so uh, yes, I do have recommendations and uh, I'll send, uh, there are actually three research papers that I, I highly recommend on, on that topic. So yeah, I'll send them. Okay, and, and now we're going back, uh, back to the window of tolerance. Mm -hmm. um, and you sort of alluded to it, but I think, um, Samantha was wondering if you could explain more ways to widen the window of tolerance. Yeah, so th there are actually lots of modalities. Um, some of them are evidence-based and some of them are not, but you know, I have the belief that um, yoga was considered to be heresy, like in even in 1994, Bessel van der Kolk, the psychiatrist expert in trauma, started suggesting that yoga might be good for reducing uh, trauma and he was practically excommunicated. And now of course we know that it's true. So I'm gonna suggest a few things that are maybe out there. So we know um, that you can widen the window of tolerance through anything that's got to do with self-regulation activities. So that might be, for example, um, many of you are familiar with uh, EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing has been found to be very helpful in widening the window of tolerance. Um, emotional freedom technique, which that's definitely out there, you know, in the wilderness, but EFT has been found to be very helpful. Uh, emotional freedom technique follows um, the acupuncture meridians and um, it's been very helpful. So it's free, doesn't cause harm. I have an open mind. Um, just basic practices where we have a chance to self-regulate as we're going through something. So I have a lot of my colleagues who have to go to court and they talk about being able to, you know, be present and grounded before, during, and after court. So all the grounding techniques, um, ooh, there's a really good book around this topic. Um, of course, it's, it's, I can't think of it right now. I will send the, the name of the book that I recommend, which has a whole host of resources to widen the window of tolerance. Um, and it's by Linda Graham. I'm just blocking the name of it right now, but I'll send that to you as well. Okay, great. Um, so uh, another question was about as a clinical supervisor, how would you support clinical therapists who may be experiencing vicarious trauma and compassion fatigue? Ooh, and you sorry. don't have another hour. I'm sorry, <laughs> I have actually a really great free resource to recommend to you. So that's gonna answer that, which of course, again, I'm gonna send uh, out to, to Wendy to share. Uh, NCTSN, and many of you are probably familiar with the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. NCTSN has developed a free, whole host of free resources on secondary trauma. 
and they recently created core supervisory competencies. So there's a whole checklist and toolkit for supervisors. How's that for a short answer? Wow, I've never seen you give such a short answer. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> okay. Um, Paula was wondering and, and wanted to let you know that so much of this resonated with her for so many reasons. And so could you perhaps suggest what are some practical ways that managers and supervisors can implement this sooner rather than later? Yes. So I want to say two things about that. Leaders are powerful role models. So one of the things is that you've got to practice what you preach. And um, telling your staff, you know, I support work-life balance or, you know, don't get too traumatized or take care of yourself, but sending emails out at three o'clock in the morning called time sensitive is not going to work. Um, Dr. Pat Fisher, who uh, has actually co-founded uh, the company with me, wrote a wonderful book called Building Resilient Teams. And it's all designed for supervisors and leaders to support their team. But, you know, that costs money and I'm not trying to promote that. I'm just saying it's a great resource. It's out there building resilient teams. Um, I think that looking at uh, case allocation, so caseloads, you know, one of the problems sometimes is some of your folks get really, really good at a certain type of issues or cases, and they are the recipient of a heavy volume. Um, being able to have an ongoing reflective supervision. Sometimes there's so little time now that we don't even have time to discuss with folks, like, what was that like for you? Proper debriefing, lots of trauma-informed care training. Sometimes when there's cutbacks, the first thing that goes by the wayside is education and training and backfill, um, but also making sure that you as a leader remain involved, you know, not just like, oh, I'll send my team to this training, but I don't need to go or, you know, there's no time. So staying on top of that and, you know, really as leaders being aware that uh, we're also affected by that. So um, I think that it starts at home. So taking care of ourselves first and being able to mentor and support um, our folks. And also looking at onboarding when we have brand new recruits, you know, remember what it's like to be new and remember that it takes a minimum of two years to be reasonably competent in your job. And what's that like if you've got a whole bunch of cynical, crispy fried people around you who say, you know, suck it up buttercup. So I think looking at the culture of the workplace is really important as well. Okay, um, thank you for that. Um, Natalie was wondering, um, she uh, has many staff that work at a university supporting international students. And while supporting them, they often share quite difficult situations that they're facing. And although their role is to recognize, respond and refer, the volume of these cases is quite heavy as well as the lack of human resources. And often they find themselves, uh, they sometimes have a difficult time um, getting them to cons salt or, or to counseling. Um, so they want to create a formal debriefing structure, but in an informal way. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips or do you know any training resources that to lead the debrief? Yeah, I would recommend that uh, you go to my website and look at the free low impact debriefing protocol um, and also the free hot walk and talk protocol. They're both on our website under resources. You can download them. And they walk you through all the steps of what we recommend uh, for proper formal and informal debriefing. Yeah, it's all there and it's free. And I feel okay. your pain, by the way, because I used to do that job and I know exactly what you're describing. It's very challenging. Okay. Um, so, and I don't, this person didn't give a name, but thank you. This is a lovely comment for you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. As a nurse, nurse and a supervisor in a community health care, how can I better support my staff with moral distress? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, policies and procedures does not accommodate life, real life situations. I could not agree with you more. Uh, moral distress is something we hear a lot in healthcare um, and any any uh, youth serving agencies or agencies that serve you know children and youth, and one of the pieces, I obviously don't have a miracle solution to this, but one of the things I've seen help with moral distress are the following. Dialogue, not being alone with this, right? Being able to have, even if it's a conversation with a trusted colleague where we say, this sucks, right? I disagree. Now, the problem with that, though, is that you don't want that to turn into like a day-to-day -day venting session where we're just, you know, gripe, griping about everything we're pissed off about, but never actually moving forward. So that can become also a pretty toxic kind of setup. So being able to have um, 
in our communities of practice, what we recommend is that there be a, a short, time-limited amount of time in the mid, in the beginning to be able to, to vent and say, that sucks, I disagree, I'm mad, whatever. Also then, looking at what are the things where we actually do have some type of advocacy. And maybe we don't, right? I think we've all been in situations where um, we don't necessarily have uh, the, the power to influence. But also deciding how are we going to get involved to advocate so that certain changes maybe can be made. And I had collected a lot of examples along the way where people said, yeah, there's certain things I had to learn to let go. There are certain things where I will deny this in court, but there are certain things where, you know, commando stealth wise, I kind of went around and still felt like I was helping, you know, informally, but also being able to decide, remember Stephen Covey's circles of control and influence, you know, the things I have control over, the things I can influence, and the things I truly have no control over, but not being alone with that, and being able to have a constructive community of practice where we can discuss and explore avenues can be highly protective to, you know, to reducing some of that. You're also making me think, when I'm done, I'm just going to send you, I have um, a resource list I, I was remiss in not sending ahead of time, and it's going to have a whole host of uh, books and resources, and one of them is a book chapter um, on moral distress that I co-wrote with a colleague, so I'll make sure that it's on there if you're interested. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then the last question that we have uh, is, what do you think the role of the media is on a population level? How can they balance the need for clicks and clickbait when appropriately reporting and not creating a frenzy? Oh, what a good question and how timely. Uh, you know, I feel, I have pretty strong opinions about this, so these are my opinions alone. Um, I feel that uh, the level of um, content and images and videos that has been shared has been becoming quite extreme. <clears throat> I'm pretty scandalized at times about um, what's being shared and reshared in terms of pretty graphic information. <clears throat> and I feel that it gets it's getting harder and harder to avoid seeing certain things. I so I have opinions about what I think the media, you know, is doing and I think that you are absolutely correct. It's all about sales and clickbait. Um, I personally have really carefully curated my own exposure. So I'm, I guess I'm just going to look at, you know, what can we do individually? I'm very, very careful about not consuming certain types of media. If there's a tragic event um, out there, I'm not, I'm deliberately not going to go and watch the footage. Um, I'm not telling you to delete your Facebook. I'm not saying that, but I deleted my Facebook on purpose because I felt that there was a lot of pretty toxic content that was coming my way. Um, so I do I do believe that there's a level of desensitization that's become more and more pronounced where there are, um, there's content that's being shared that uh, to me is actually, it's pretty outrageous. And I think that we individually have to take over, you know, kind of this decision about what are we gonna allow to come into our brains and what we're not. So I'm very, very careful about that. Uh, because they at least I can control that part, right? Okay. Um, well, I just want to say thank you. You once again, I've learned many more things from you, and I will continue my learning journey with you. And I think most importantly, you've shared with us your deep and rich knowledge, your experience, and your evidence-based suggestions. So thank you for taking the time to share that with us and providing all of these resources that we will also continue to share with the community of practice. Um, to all of the audience, I wanna thank you for staying with us and for taking the time and engaging in self-care by being here today. Um, we will be putting the web in, um, we will be uh, asking you to fill our, or encouraging you to fill out our short survey um, and remember that helps us uh, get the feedback and also will su uh, support our work going forward. So thank you for joining us and good luck. Today is the first day of your new self-care program. Thanks again. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.